Welcome back to another episode of California MBA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion podcast. I am your host, Shashank Shekhar. I am the founder and CEO of Insta Mortgage. And this podcast is brought to you because of our fabulous sponsors, Prime Lending. So thank you, Prime Lending, for doing this. Uh, I have two very, very special people in, uh, for this podcast. I uh, am super delighted uh, to have Rosalind Hardy that I've known for, for some period of time and, and have fallen in love with a lot of things that she's doing. So we'll talk, talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we are also joined by Bill Hardy, who's Rosalind, um, Rosalind's husband. And he has, a, he has an amazing story to tell, especially from a DNI perspective. So we'll get into that. So welcome to the show, Rosalind and, and Bill. Thank you. Thank you. To be here. Cool. Uh, I'll start with you, Bill, first, is because I, I was very moved um, when I heard your story, both uh, growing up in Louisiana and um, and working for Air Force. So uh, tell our audience a little bit about what that growing up was like um, and and what what was it like to work for the for the Air Force when you were working for them? Well, it was um, just one little correction. actually, I'm from Mississippi. Okay, great. better than Louisiana. <laughs> so, so my, um, my but husband. it was um it was a it was a unique and different experience because when I went into the Air Force in 66, um, Mississippi was, an, was a segregated state, yes. um, like many Southern states were. But going into the Air Force was an opportunity for me to be something different than what I had been uh, exposed to as a child growing up in the South. And um, I remember like it was yesterday, taking the oath um, to, um, um, to defend the constitution of the country. And as I was sitting there or standing there with my hand raised, the first thing I thought about was that, wow, um, you know, I can't even go into the White House cafe um, and sit down and eat uh, a hamburger or I can't go at the counter and get a soda because if I did, I would be you know, rushed off to jail. Um, so going into the Air Force um, was an opportunity for me to see a different world and, and to really grow the inside of me out. And, and, and that actually happened because growing, going into the Air Force, but there were no stop gates for me. Mm -hmm. um, I could be who I really felt that I was. And so um, I ranked really quickly um, in the Air Force uh, in higher ranking. Um, I ended up uh, going into security police and becoming a policeman mm -hmm. and um, or security police for the Air Force. And by doing that, I had an opportunity to um, witness a lot of issues and I grew up. The Air Force was probably one of the best thing that happened to me in my life. Well, one of the best things because I had to grow up overnight. Um, here you are an 18 year old, now 19 year old um, coming out of the civilian life, going through boot camp, and now all of a sudden coming to Vandenberg Air Force Base, which where, where I was stationed. and telling you that you've got to guard a $400 million missile uh, that's going to be launching something out into space. And, um, and the Russians were off the, off the, in the ocean, uh, you know, adjacent to where we were at Vandenberg. And you'd have to be dealing with people who wanted to come in and sabotage um, the gantries and so forth. And um, so I immediately started college at Allen Hancock Junior College mm -hmm. when I was at Vandenberg and I entered and stayed in school all of the time that I was in, in the Air Force. And so at, at Vandenberg from you know, June of 66 to uh, November of 68, where I, after I left it and cross trained and became a designer mm -hmm. for the Air Force because I felt that being a security policeman um, with issues that I had from growing up in the South, having now the ability to carry 38 Smith and Western on my side and on my shoulder, an M16, this may not be 
I, I realized quickly that I um, police work was not for me because <laughs> I had an attitude problem. All right. And so Rosalind, does I, I still have one? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Not as much. <laughs> so, so as a result, I cross trained and became a designer. Okay. Um, and uh, and this was part of what God had gifted me as, as a designer and being creator and imagineer. And so I then got married. <clears throat> uh, this is to a previous um, lady mm -hmm. and then got sent to Vietnam. So I ended up going to Vietnam into the war zone, uh, even though I didn't want to go, but I did and uh, enjoyed it. Uh, and it was probably the best year of my career as a designer in the Air Force. And just to make the long story short, um, out of all of the work that we did at Tonsonut Air Base at Saigon, uh, the main gate and all of the bunkers around that I designed, ended up getting an Air Force Accommodation Medal. Um, and, um, and I was very proud of that. And I took that experience mm -hmm. coming out of the Air Force and looking at an ad in the LA Times at Walt Disney at Wet Enterprise for a draftsman, I applied for it. They asked me if I had a portfolio. I took my portfolio the next day and they said, you have the job. And I says, well, you know, I have to go back to see my parents. My father was ill. They says, Will, you've got the job. Um, go back home. You tell us when you want to come to work. Sure. So this was during a period when um, Companies around the country were now beginning to hire African Americans mm -hmm. in the structure of their corporations in um, in all parts of, of management, and so I came back and started work in December. Two months later, I became their first Imagineer um, as an Af as an African American, and they assigned me to the um, fantasy land and this was the project for Walt Disney World yeah. so here I was 23 years old um, an Imagineer for Walt Disney I uh, never would think that I would become an Imagineer for Walt Disney um, and being charged to design the Mr. Toad ride Snow White the Seven Dwarfs to 20,000 League Underwater Show wow. And uh, and the African section for it's a small world, uh -huh. uh, and these were my projects that I actually did, and I did some Main Street scenes as well as I don't know if you've ever been to Walt Disney World. I have. Yes. You have. If you've ever been into the Contemporary Hotel, there's a mural in that hotel. The the monorail goes right through the hotel. That mural I did not design, but I designed the four the the twelve by twelve inch square of that mural. So, so when they put it together at Walt Disney World, the entire mural then would come together, come together. And so it was, it was really impressive. And, um, but I got, I, I got a little nod about going into the real estate industry. Okay. And, um, and I, I left all of this behind me and went into real estate and the rest is history. You know, and for that, you know, I ended up getting a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting, Bachelor of Science in real estate uh, finance, getting a broker. Um, I've now been a broker now for 47 years, been in the industry now 52 years. So um, that 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 journey through the Air Force brought out who I really was. Because what happened in Mississippi when I got out of high school, I went to work to apply for a job at the local manufacturing Lazy Boy. And the person then in, in human resources says, well, you were a part of the civil rights movement here in Newton. We can't give you this job because you're the rowdy one. And, and basically they says, you'll never get a job here in in this town. Wow. And um, because I had gone to jail for sure. sitting at the counter for drinking a Coca Cola. Um, several times I thought I was being taken to be hung. Um, so I ended up being basically ran out of Mississippi, uh, out of my town. 
And, but what they did not know, the people there did not know what it was doing to me. And it, it, it made me angry, I was sad, but there became another me as a human being. And the only thing that I could think of is that why is it that people treat people of color mm -hmm. this way? I just didn't see, I didn't see any benefit from that. Uh, I thought it was sad that people had no better understanding of human nature than to discriminate just because of color. Because I had never done anything to anybody. Uh, I don't know any people of color had ever done anything to whites sure. back in the yeah. South. But, you know, um, in their mind, they wanted you to say yes, sir, no, sir, to them, call them Mr. and Mrs. Mm -hmm. They call you by your first name. Um, and to this very day, uh, at times I think about all of this, but it made me a better man because in that I became closer to um, my, my savior. Um, and I realized that I can't hate people just because who they are. Mm -hmm. I have to move beyond who they are and become me for whom God had made me to really be. And as a result, that's who I became. And, and that, that training through the Air Force and through Disney, and as a result of my growing up in the South, remember, I was born and grew up in probably the worst bigot state in the country, and that mm -hmm. was Mississippi. I mean, if you've heard stories of Mississippi, yes. mm -hmm. um, you have read them. I lived them. I was a part of that history. I was the one who went to jail. I was the guy who did the sit-ins. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a real person right now. And so Will, let me let me ask you this there. That, so you have seen yourself, you mentioned a couple of times that that all these experiences have made you the person that you are today. You, you, you were born in Mississippi, you went to Air Force where you were really good at what you did, but you could not even go and get, get a soda for yourself because, because you were banned from doing this. You did not want to end up in jail just because you wanted a soda from a place where, where you were not allowed to. To the current world where you have, you have been in the real estate industry now for 30, 40 years, you went and worked for, for Walt Disney. Uh, how do you see the outside world? How do you see America changing from the time that that you were in Mississippi to the time now that we are we, we are doing this show. So last 30, 40 years, from from you from inside, how do you see the outside world? How has the country changed when it comes to accepting African American people or accepting people of color? What kind of change have you seen uh, during this period? Can I be honest with you? And I well, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, this is uh, we show seen, where you can be honest. We've seen, I've seen you know, steps of changes. Okay. But in the deep soul of America, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be real with you now. Yep. In the deep soul of America, if you were to have a private survey mm -hmm. of whites in this country today, and one of the questions were, would you, prefer going back to slavery days. I would say that 70% would say yes, because it's in their nature to want to control. And that was what I saw and was taught in the South. And in, in talking to people today, I still see and feel the spirit of control. There are many people, and I know many of them, and they're white, and I know their spirit is not bigotry. It just, there's just something about them that I know, all right? And it's different. It's easy to tell an individual who is still following the rules of the past. Mm -hmm. America has changed. Yeah. But it has changed in a hypocritical nature, all right? And that is, we want to speak that we are 
together and one, but we don't live as we are one. Very well said, uh, Well, And that, that kind of, uh, not directly to the point what, what you were saying, but comparing uh, specifically within housing, comparing 60s to now, the black home home ownership was actually higher in, in 66 and 68 than, than where it is now. So it's not directly comparing what you said to what, what's happening in housing. But, but, but let, me, let me, hold, hold your thought. Sure. But let yeah. me help you understand why that worked. Because mm -hmm. at that time, it was, there was the, you know, in a, in a society, in a community, there were white communities and African-American communities, mm -hmm. Latino communities, and, and predominantly Mississippi didn't have Latinos for the most part, mm -hmm. you know, primarily Indians, mm -hmm. you know, um, the, the, you know, uh, um, you know, th they were just not there. But the reason was because you were building up the community in the black community. It was, you were segregated. In other words, you're segregated, but equal, you know, separate, but equal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why, because, you know, black folks were working together. They had jobs. Um, they had their own businesses and they were progressive and they, they wanted to, you know, you could only go to a white mortgage company uh, to get loans mm -hmm. or bank, but they were directing you to a neighborhood that was not integrated. Yeah, okay. redlining. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Rosalind, let me uh, let me come to you on on this because this is uh, this is something which is of course hugely important, not just for here at California MBA or the DNI committee, but but for the housing industry and the country overall. Uh, tell me about your experience. You are, you're, of course, very successful as, uh, as the president of, of QCP Systems, a company that, that you run. But of course, this, is, this did not happen overnight. Tell me about your journey a little bit uh, within the mortgage space, within the housing space. How did you come to the, come to the place where you are right now? Okay. Um, I am celebrating. Are you talking to me or Rosalind? Uh, Rosalind. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I want her to answer that. Yes. Um, my husband has a lot of great stories, a lot of history, but for me, I started in the mortgage industry back out of savings and loans okay. that I started working for. And within that space, I realized, even though I was a very introverted type of person, and I start, I talked myself into a secretary job for the loan servicing manager. And I knew nothing about being a secretary, but I was able to talk myself into that job. And fortunately, she was new at her job, the loan servicing manager. So I think that helped me. Sure. But I was blessed enough to have someone that was willing to mentor me in the area of mortgages in the servicing area. So I basically just absorbed and learned everything that I could about that. And during the course of that time, when the um, savings and loan uh, debacle started to happen, all of a sudden the industry started talking about quality control and okay. that interested me. And real quickly, um, nobody was raising their hands in the bank to take on that task mm -hmm. to, to do the whole quality control requirements that were now being put forth. And so I got my nerve up to go to the senior vice president over the mortgage department and I asked him could I do that work okay and because nobody else wanted to do that work <laughs> yes he agreed to let me do the work and so that's how I got started in the quality control and compliance space is when that bank and as I came up through the ranks I knew there was just something in me, and I think it's true for a lot of people of color. You just felt you had to do it better. You had to work harder. You had to just do everything. I got to the place where I was the one who was opening up the bank. I was the first one in the bank, and I was the last one in the bank. Mm -hmm. And just working as hard as I could to prove myself. I just felt I had to show that I could do this. And, and I, I did. God was good, and I was able to to excel into being, you know, assistant vice president and all of that. But 
the biases, as Will indicated, clearly it has changed from when he was growing up in Mississippi to now. Sure. But those biases that he kind of alluded to, unfortunately, still did exist because just one real quick anecdotal story, when I happened to be up on the senior level floor, the way the bank was situated, they had a whole floor for their loan servicing department. And at that time, most of the employees working were African-Americans in yeah. the loan servicing space. And I heard the president of the bank talking to the uh, senior VP and general counsel and he referred to his employees in the servicing level, he referred to that area as his plantation. Wow. And what year I, are we talking here, Rosalind? We are actually talking 1985. Wow. 85, 86. And that kind of took me back when he, and I heard him, I would just happen to be up there and I heard, I said, did he really say that? And, but he was a very nice man. And I had had plenty of interaction with him and he had never shown any overt or outward bias towards me. So I was, I was taken aback a little bit to hear, overhear yeah. him say that about that floor. But I, it helped me to understand, uh, Shashank, that people do have stuff yeah. underneath yeah. that goes on. But yeah. you, you teach yourself how to still be functional and work and interact with people. And a lot of times we are successful and able to interact with each other because we keep that other stuff down deep. We don't let it show up, you know, mm -hmm. but every now and then it bubbles to the top. So anyway, as I came on through the industry, I stayed in this area of compliance and QC and worked my way through. And once again, this industry goes through cycles, as you know, Shashank, it goes yeah. up and down, up and down, mm -hmm. up and down. And so I found myself out of work during the next downturn. And when the savings and loans went out of business and everything happened, I, and they shut, they sh eventually shut the bank down that I was working for, the government did. And I was pregnant at the time. And I also found out that was interesting that as much experience as I had, when I would go out and people were excited about talking to me, mm -hmm. but then when I would go into the person to person interview and I'm sticking out here pregnant, <laughs> they weren't really excited about hiring me because they're like, okay, she's not going to be here long because she's going to be going out on maternity leave. Yeah. And so I found myself not able to get a job. And I realized it, it that, I just felt in my heart, it couldn't be because of my experience. It had oh, to be because course. I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so my husband asked me, so what are you gonna do? And so I started putting together this company called QCP Systems, a quality mm -hmm. control company. And that's what I said I wanted to do. I said, I wanted to start my own company and do this. And so he helped me to pull it all together and it was all in order, Shashank, and I'm gonna tell on myself here. When I went to make myself my very first sales call, I froze up and I, <laughs> I could not sell it. And so I hung up the phone and I sat there and I cried a little bit. My husband looked at me like, what's wrong with you? I said, I can't do this. And he says, well, I can't do this because I don't know quality control. <laughs> so he released me. He said, go take care of the babies because I had two <laughs> babies by then. <laughs> And that's what I did. And I never looked back at that company again until it came up in 2008 when I was having to shut down a quality control company that I was running for a couple. Mm -hmm. and it was an African-American couple. Well, because once again, the industry was going through its downturn. We know what happened. The industry yep. blew up and they were not able to keep their company going. So I had to shut it down. My husband again asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to stay in this area, I think. I want to keep doing this because companies are really going to need the help because the government's going to come down hard now on this industry with regulations. And they're going to need some help navigating the area. So I want to do this. And so he said to me, Shashay, you know that company you came up with all those years uh -huh. ago? I said, yes. He said, well, I actually have 
that folder with all that information. I said, no way. He said, no. <laughs> so all I have to do is get you licensed up again, find you a space, and we can start this company. And that's what happened. We started QCP Systems in 2008. In February 2nd was our first day at the worst possible time yeah. <laughs> in this country. Yep. And God has blessed us. We have done well. We were able to do what was in my heart to do. And that was to be there for companies that were going to need to navigate this space. And we continue to do that. That is our mission and that is to be a help and to support people who are, most people in this industry are working and they do the work they do to support their families and the employees that they serve. And we do our best to help support them in doing that and being successful in it. The, the whole diversity equity, I've been working that issue all through my career and a, we didn't call it back then in the day when I was doing it, D-E-N-I. Sure. Yeah, yes, it, of course. It, it was all about <laughs> fair lending and fair housing and making sure that people had access, that everybody had access to mm -hmm. it. And I have been working this for a long time. That's one of the things I loved about you and your company, that you focused yeah. in yeah. that area. You embraced it. And, and that's really what, my hope and wish is, is that the mortgage industry as a whole mm -hmm. will do as you have done with your company, that we embrace the broader segment of Americans that want a home and help them to do that. Meet them where they are and help them get to where they want to go. And I think that's what I heard you say you do with your company. And Absolutely. You everyone should do. And that's my mission with DNI, and that is help us to diversify our labor force because then people are, are able to come in and see people that look like them. They're able to talk to people on the phone. They're able to Zoom with them and interact and they are able to engage and everybody then is able to grow and lift. And that's what the Cal MBA, California MBA is trying to do with the DE&I committee. Provide the information, provide the resources that we can ferret out to yeah. help the industry to do this work. Because when we do it, Shoshane, I've always been a believer. You do the right thing with the right motives, the money will come. Yeah, of course. Come. And, and, and everybody wins. And I'm believing this is gonna be a time for us to all win and to make this happen. Yeah, what an amazing story, um, Will and Rosalind. And, and I mean, not just, uh, Will's story was, of course, very, very moving. And a lot of the audience here may be young enough where they, they probably uh, have only read, as Will said, they were probably only read about what happened in Mississippi. They have, of course, they were probably not even born at that point of time to, to know what was exactly going on. But Will fought through all of that. Will fought through all of those biases. You mentioned not just being a Black woman at work, but being pregnant and trying to look for a job. And that's part of DNI as well. It's not just about people of color. It's not, you mentioned Fair Housing, you mentioned Equal Credit Opportunity Act. I mean, all of that means that we can't have biases uh, for any reason, not just people of color. I mean, we cannot not give job to a pregnant woman because I mean, that's that's a form of discrimination at the end of the day. So so thank you for sharing your stories. Really, this is this is what this this podcast is all about. And as you mentioned, Rosalind, of course, at, at Instramogis, some of the things that you talked about. What D and I means to you is what we try to live, and not just not just talk about it. So thank you everyone for tuning in uh, to this show with with the amazing couple Rosalind and Will Hardy here. Um, I was personally extremely moved um, and still inspired because this podcast is also all about hope, and and not just about what's wrong in the industry and in the country, but also the fact that you can you can meet people like like Will and Rosalind and learn from them that how they fought through all of this. And it still turned out to be extremely successful in what they do. So this is your host, Shashank Shaker, founder and CEO of Instramogit, signing off on this podcast. I would like to thank Will and Rosalind for making it to this show. So, so thank you both of you for, for being here. And uh, stay tuned for the, for the next episode of California MBA DNI's next podcast, uh, which is sponsored by Prime Lending. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Me.